I will open it up to you guys, you know, answer some of your questions and queries that you may have. And what steps do you normally approach to the victims, for example? Our organisation, we come in at all sorts of places. We make sure that they ring the police, they ring DV Connect, whatever they need to do to look after themselves, and then we come in and we support them after that. Women ring when they're ready. I've had women ring me after 18 years. How long has it been? 18 years. I've got four kids. Coercive control, it could be just, I have to ring my husband every time I leave the house. Following up on where you're spending your money, who are you spending your time with, where are you going, what are you doing, that's that sort of coercive control. Is there any strategy or program in your organisation to stop uh, this kind of violence? Look, there always is, um, and, and it's difficult because, like I said, we're voluntary and we're unfunded. So we don't have capacity to do the big, you know, um, uh, big campaigns. What, what we do do is make sure that whatever campaigns are out there are available in other languages. We certainly try to put some stuff on our, face, on our uh, website and uh, Facebook page. Um, but yeah, I think for certainly for our community, we need to talk to them differently. Um, and, and having um, current government um, advertising that's out there doesn't address a lot of the things that our women are going through. And I think it's important too that we've got to provide ethno specific services. And that's the difficulty I have is because women don't see where they can go that to talk about their issues with women that understand what they're going through. And I think that's that's a big flaw in our system. Um, they just expect that, you know, you'll just ring the police, you'll ring DV Connect, which is fine, you can do that. But if these people at the other end don't understand what especially um, our women are going through, then it's going to be very hard to find a solution for them. You know, my mother-in-law is being nasty to me. Well, then, you know, ignore her. Well, hang on, I live in the same house as her. Um, you know, so so how do you do that? Because it's it's a foreign concept to white people that don't live with their mother-in-laws. Um, so so for our women, it's different. Um, you know, a lo lots of other things around that sort of stuff. You know, arranged marriages, for instance, that's a foreign concept. Um, cousin marriages, that's a foreign concept. You know, so all of those sorts of things. Until people are familiar and understand the culture associated with that, understand some of those traditional values, understand some of those conservative values, um, you're never going to be able to get the right information. So, yeah, look, we try to do what we can do. Uh, we guide women. A lot of women, you know, have been through that. They don't want to go to the police. They don't want to do it. They just want, okay, how do I fix this? How do I help myself through this? What's my next step? And I could be sitting on the phone for an hour and they'll put the phone down and say, thank you very much. My head is clear. I'm, I'm, I'm a lot better. I can handle this better now. And that's all, that's the only contact they'll have with us. And you may not hear from them again and they may ring you, you know, years later and say, you remember me, I rang and this is what I did and, and now look where I am. And I always say success is the best revenge. Um, so, so uh, you know, women come through all their stages of life and they try to get as much information. We try to get as much information out there as we can, but also let them know. And it's not even about information. You can't keep providing, this is what I say to government, you can't keep providing um, advertising and information and said you can get help and ring this number and and uh, go to the police and do this and do that if there's nowhere for these women to go if there's no safe housing available to them if they've got an escape of violent situation and there's no safe housing where do they go and then they think well if I ring he's going to they're going to tell me to get out and I've got nowhere to go and I've got three kids and they've all got to go to school what do I do so then they just say well I'll just stay with it next time I'll just lock my door so that he doesn't come into my room all those sorts of things so women then try to work out how do they protect themselves within the household because there's nowhere else for them to go you know if they're on temporary visas they don't get Centrelink money so where do they go um and and what what help do they get so so it's all right to say, you know, um, you can ring DV Connect, you can ring the police, you can ring all these helplines or whatever. But if there's no help available at the other end, nobody's answering the phone and then there's nowhere for them to go. There's no refuges available. There's no safe housing available. Then what's the point? And then there's nobody there to talk to them. There's no service providers out there that understand what they're going through. Then you make you don't make it uh, easy for them. If, the, if, if a brown woman walks into an organisation that's there to help her around domestic abuse, and sees a sea of white faces, and she has English as a second language or a third language, she's going to disengage fairly quickly. 
She might make that initial thing and she might just turn around and say, this is all too hard. How do I explain my situation to you when you don't understand? So they've got, you, you can't just get women out of an abusive relationship and then have them in this big whirlpool of them just walking around thinking, where do I get help from? You've actually got to provide the help and you've got to provide the services first and then tell the women to come in. And I think we just do it ask about at the moment that we just tell women to escape, but escape to what? Escape to where? You know, we put them in a motel for a night or two and get them out of that abusive relationship. Well, then she's thinking, um, I'm sitting in a motel, I've got four walls and a roof around me, um, you know, where I came out of a household that had 10 people in it. And, you know, my kids are missing their father or their grandmother or their cousins or their my auntie or whatever the situation is, because invariably our families, you know, are, are quite uh, big families. So in that, in that situation, women think, well... At least I had a roof over my head and at least I had a bed to sleep in and at least I had food on the table. So maybe I'll go back. And that's what they do. And they go back. And so I've spoken to women, you know, the woman the other day, he sexually abused me. I've been talking to her for the last 18, she's in Melbourne. I've been talking to her for the last 18 months, two years. Um, and, and she knew that she was sexually abused. And I told her, you know, don't have a shower, make sure you call the police, tell them whatever, don't change your clothes, all of that. Went through the whole process. Um, and, and she's doing, you know, she's doing a master's degree. So she knows what the situation is. I guarantee you she hasn't rung the police. And that was on Sunday. I guarantee you she hasn't rung the police. Oh, let me work out the pros and cons. Let me do this. Let me do that. So, again, trying to justify in her own mind what's going to be better for her. At the end of the day, what's better for her is to ring the police because that man is not going to stop. He is using this as a test case. If she doesn't do anything, tomorrow he'll come back and do exactly the same thing because he knows that she's going to keep her mouth shut. And that's the problem. Women need to stand up, and especially our women who are meek and mild and a bit, you know, well, we don't talk against our husband and we don't want to air our dirty laundry. I don't care. Air the dirty laundry because that's the only thing that's going to save you. Forget about what people talk about. Oh, people are going to talk about me. Or there's no respect. Or there's no this. Don't care. You need to worry about yourself. You need to look after yourself. You need to look after yourself and your children. Because if you don't do that, not only are you not protecting yourself, you're not protecting your kids because your kids are seeing what's happening and they're going to grow up in that environment and they're going to turn 18 and they're going to take off because that's a toxic family that you've brought them up in. And they may cut contact or they may just turn out to be just as dysfunctional as what the family is. And they've got their own problems and then they'll have their own relationships and then create this whole thing scenario all over again. And it's learned behaviour. So protect your children. And I think a lot of times I talk about the kids in these relationships because they want their mothers are very close to their kids and they want to keep their kids. Um, but then I talk to them about the impacts of domestic abuse on the children. Yeah, okay, you can handle it. You're an adult. But your six-year-old can't. Okay, your eight-year-old can't. And not only that, your eight-year-old's at school learning about this sort of stuff, so he knows exactly what's going on. So it's about understanding that until you stand up and do anything, I can't come and help you. I don't know what's going on. Um, but if once you reach out, then, then understand that I'm going to give you that information. And again, I can't force you. I can't ring the police on your behalf. So I can't force you to do that, but I would strongly recommend at every opportunity, use the availability of the services that are out there. And then after that, we can come in and support you through that service. We can support you. Through, I go to court every second day, just about, sit with women, work through the process, um, you know, do all of that and make sure that they're comfortable and make sure that they don't feel afraid or they don't feel intimidated. So that's the sort of thing that we do. It's a little bit more hands-on than a lot of other organisations. And again, you know, we do it because our women probably need a little bit more help and a little bit more guidance. Um, but one day we'll get paid for our work. At the moment, we don't. <laughs> <laughs>